Freedom Riders on NPT is made possible by the generous support of Baker Donaldson, offering legal clients knowledgeable guidance from experienced industry and client service teams in 16 offices across the Southeast and Washington, D.C. In 1961, the Congress of Racial Equality set out to test a 1960 Supreme Court decision that outlawed racial segregation in interstate bus terminals and restaurants. Thirteen riders, black and white, boarded buses in Washington, D.C. for a trip through the South to New Orleans. The plan was to openly disobey the Jim Crow segregation laws throughout the trip. By the time the original 13 reached Birmingham, Alabama, one bus had been burned, riders had been beaten, and no driver could be found to continue their journey. I was dispatched by the Attorney General of the United States to fly those Freedom Riders safely to New Orleans, which I did. And then an extraordinary group of college students here in Nashville, kids really, took it upon themselves to complete what CORE began. These young people, trained in nonviolence, left Nashville in bus after bus, heading south. Many of us told them to turn back, that this was not the time, this was not the way to change society. The Nashville students were beaten, arrested, put in jail, but they ultimately showed that we were wrong and they were right. That was the time, that was the way, and they changed the South and our country. Fifty years later, we brought four of these extraordinary people into NPT's studio to tell us about that time and answer questions from today's students. Our panel includes Dr. Rip Patton, Susan Wilbur Wamsley, Dr. Catherine Berg Brooks, and Matthew Walker. We started the conversation by asking them why they left school to pick up where the original Freedom Riders left off. Well, I think we have to start with the sit-ins. I would go all the way back to late 59, early 60s, when Lawson came to town and was having workshops and instilled within us uh, about our fellow man. And instilled this is Jim Lawson. Jim Lawson. Who at that time was the Divinity School at Vanderbilt. Yes. And instilled in us about uh, your fellow man and turning the cheek and the whole, all that we read in the Bible, and of course we had had our sit-ins, we were successful with our sit-ins, which drew us closer together. We had a close-knit family of students. And so when Diane uh, said that we would continue the Freedom Ride, that was no problem. That was brothers and sisters. That's there, Diane there. Nash. Diane who, Nash. You all had elected as your leader. Yes. And she was what a Fisk. She was a Fiskite. Junior. I mean. And uh, so there was no problem uh, dropping out of school and uh, getting on the bus and continuing the freedom <clears> ride. You say there's no problem about it, but you're right at the end of your school year. This is May. You're almost ready um, to get out of school and. This comes up. Was it any any struggle in your mind about whether you should stay and finish your exams or go? I had no problems with it at all. Uh, it's it's like uh, I think if I had decided to take exams, it would have been like a cooling off period, and then I would have had a chance to think, and maybe I would not have been a part of the Freedom Ride. That is a possibility. What was the fever? Uh, I call it that. Maybe fervor would be a better word. But what was it that pulled you like a magnet uh, into this? I'm sitting here and can afford to call it um, foolhardy uh, escapade. And I'm sure some parents thought it was a foolhardy escapade. Um, parents thought this is going to change nothing. Our children are going to get beaten and arrested. And I mean, what was it, Catherine? That well, with me, I would have to go back to when I was about five years old, and that's why you know, uh, children is very important how you treat children because they don't uh, usually forget. 
So what I mean by that is that I can remember my mother taking me downtown to shop. And she, uh, when white people would approach us, and I'm from Birmingham, Alabama, when white people would approach us, she would pull me in front of her. And I resented that. She pulled me in front of her so they wouldn't bump me. And so when I got to the fifth grade, I had to leave my little area and go across town to school because there were no school in my area that I could go to. My little four room uh, elementary school went to the uh, fourth grade. Fifth grade, I had to go across town. At the, and there was no school bus. So I had to get two uh, buses. And that was from the fifth grade through the 12th grade. And so when white people would approach, if they didn't move, then we bumped. So I said that I had been bumping white people for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and usually they would, you know, step aside or we bump. Now, it may have been different if I had been a boy. So now when uh, the sit-ins started, so I was ready. Matthew, um, son of a doctor, distinguished doctor in Nashville. Um, you're at Fisk. Mm -hmm. Did you sit in on the early workshops that Reverend Lawson conducted in the church? Yes, uh, as a matter of fact, I couldn't miss those workshops because they were conducted at the church which I had been attending all my life. Clark Memorial United Methodist Church. Jim was a Methodist man minister, and so um, he started his workshops right there at Clark Memorial, 14th and Phillips. And in coming to church every Sunday, I learned about the workshops and started attending in uh, 59 and fall of 59. Now, it, it, still, you're very young. Fair to call you a child, even. Mm -hmm. I'm sure both your mother and father thought of you still as a, as a child. Mm -hmm. Just think of it as a, as a boy mm -hmm. sitting at that counter, uh, that mock counter. Um, did you ever imagine as you were sitting there listening to your friends prepare you for the violence that might come they heaped abuse on you, shouted slurs and insults at you. Some of you were pushed over the counter. Some of you were slugged by your friends to prepare you to take this with nonviolence. Um, did you ever believe the reality of the moment would come, or was this just an exercise, um, a Jim Lawson exercise to make you think more deeply? That's an interesting question. I believe we all thought that we were training for something, but the day that we were supposed to start sitting in was a little later than we actually started because February 1, 1960, the four students sat in at uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, and this was the first sit-in the country had seen. Now, you all were already in training. We were in training on February 1, 1960. When their when sit-ins their occurred. When sit-in occurred. This gave us a little spur, and we started talking about, they've done it, let's get started here. There was some difference of opinion between the young and the old. There was always some creative tension, you might say, mm -hmm. between the <laughs> younger uh, people and the older people. So we finally began uh, to sit in on the 13th of February, and um, that was a little, a little less than two weeks after Greensboro, and what's interesting about Nashville is even though we started our city in later than Greensboro, we achieved integration here in Nashville about two months before Greensboro did, where it all started. Susan Wilbur, um, as you were, <laughs> right. uh, you were at Peabody. I was. Um, these students are across town going through workshops. How did you get involved? Well, actually, students came to talk to us. Um, and I don't know if Catherine was, was no, with them, was uh, with but s students came just to talk to us and they said that they were doing 
at that time students was, from the African American universities. Right. At that time, I think were the stand-ins. I think the sit-ins had been possibly the year before when I was actually a senior in high school. And the stand-ins were focused toward the theaters, the movie theaters. And, and to get into a theater, then if you were black, you had to go around the alley, buy a ticket up two flights of stairs, correct, um, and sit in a, a segregated balcony. So yes. this is. This is where you came into it. And so they came to, to talk to us, and uh, we got interested. I, I, I don't know if we completely uh, knew what, this, you know, what we were getting into, but we just felt like it was the right thing to do. My sister and I both uh, participated in the, um, in the stand-ins. And then, as Rip said, we all kind of got to know each other. This was unique for me because I grew up in Nashville and I was a, you know, a white southerner. So everything was segregated. I, I knew basically no, no black uh, kids. We were kids then uh, at all. And so when, we, when, when they came to talk to us and we thought more about it, we had, we had seen a little bit of it happening when I, as I said, I was a senior in high school. My mom, I remember, came home very upset one day because they'd had maybe the first sit-ins and there'd been some violence, and but not bad violence, and she was terrified. She said, I'm afraid there's going to be violence on this and somebody's really going to get hurt. But, you know, I was a senior and I was thinking about the prom and things like that and not really tuned in too much. So I didn't really get involved until I was a freshman and my sister was a junior at that time. But we got to know each other, all of us, and we really did become a family. Um, it suddenly dawned on us, I think, how, how terribly unfair it was. And, and um, we didn't have to experience as, as white people ever, I think. I think, it, we, I think everybody involved, anybody who's white in, that was involved in the movement does need to clarify the fact that we still couldn't in some ways not ever experience what it was like to be black and what it had been like for you growing up, you know, all your lives. So, because uh, we could always kind of go back to our neighborhoods, you know, go you back know, to... You know, we're going to have a, uh, a conversation with the audience during our um, meeting here, and um, I always find better questions come from the audience when I moderate then right. come from me. And I see we have our first one. Um, yes, this question is for you, Miss Susan. I was wondering, when you decided to participate in the Freedom Rides, how did your family and your friends react to it, since you came from a white family and all that? OK. Uh, well, actually, I'm glad you asked that, because one of the things I, I noticed that Jim Swerg in the documentary, The Freedom Rides, was talking about um, how much he thanked his parents. My mom, my dad died when I was only four, so there was just my mom, and she was a commercial artist and worked uh, actually for Mr. Siegenthaler's paper, uh, drawing fashions for Harvey's department store. She was actually, in, in my mind, in a lot of ways, the hero in, in this uh, as well, because she did support us. And um, my son Jonathan is in the audience today. He drove up from Charlottesville. And um, I think sometimes about how terrified I would be if he told me that he was going to do something like this. I know she must have been horribly frightened, and she had a lot to lose. Uh, she could have lost her job. She could. We lived in a neighborhood where nobody understood this. Um, and yet she said, well, I've always taught you that certain things are right. I guess I can't really tell you not to do it now. So, um, so she was supportive. Were most of your friends also against it or were they for it? Um, strangely enough, by the time I was in college, I had a couple of really close friends who were uh, in agreement and supportive, which was nice. Uh, I had some, some people that I had grown up with didn't understand. I, I had one best friend in high school whose father would, uh, would not let her even speak to me anymore, so that was kind of unusual. But, but I, I can't say that everybody shunned us, which was good. And our neighbors actually wound up in this little neighborhood in East Nashville that we lived in, um, being 
telling us that they would come over. Uh, we had some bomb threats and things later on after Mr. Siegenthaler and our, our ride, and he got knocked out. But that's another story. Um, we had some, some issues at home, and neighbors actually called and, and told my mom that they would come over, and one man said, I have a gun. <laughs> and uh, so it turned out okay. But thank you for your question. You have a question. Yes. Uh, this is for Matthew Walker. Mm -hmm. uh, we often talk about the civil rights movement and the successes of it, but we talk about it as though it's in a vacuum, like there's no longer systemic, structural, and institutional racism that continues to haunt us. So, Brother Matt, I know I continue to work with you today as we attempt to deconstruct some of those systems. How can we talk about this in a way that is just not in a historical context, but as something that we're continuing to work on and are faced with as a nation? Just like to say that the first thing that you can change, which requires your participation, which requires you to influence others to participate, is the vote. Just think about the percentage of people that vote in the average election. That can surely be improved. When you have the right people in office, you don't have the problems that we're seeing today. The budget cuts for so many social programs for example, these are happening because the wrong people have gotten elected. It's up to you to make sure the right people get in office. So this is just an example of uh, the way you can use social responsibility in ways that are relevant today, just as when we were your age, we were socially responsible in ways that were relevant then. I want to come back and ask more about uh, the women's involvement in the movement, because it seems to me it's it's really uh, an issue that's been somewhat overlooked in, in when we talked about the heroism of the rides. Bull Connor, who preferred to be called Bull, um, doesn't necessarily like um, the fact that you're singing and praying. Mm -hmm. And he decides he's going to get rid of you. That he's going to bring you out of that jail. Um, we got a call from the FBI, those of us in the Justice Department, who said that you'd been kidnapped from jail and that there was a motorcade that had gone off somewhere. Now, you thought you were going back to Nashville. That's right. He took you up to the Alabama line, crossed it, and dumped you. Yeah, he dumped it across the line. Right. He, he, but you, uh -huh. you, <laughs> You had a conversation with him. Yes, I did. And would you just tell us about that conversation? You thought you were going all the way back to Nashville. Well, yes, I thought I was going all the way back to Nashville, so I was on the front seat in, in, in the center, and, and uh, Bull, you know, next to the, the door here, and the driver, and uh, in the back seat, it was John Lewis, uh, Lucretia Collin, and uh, a reporter from the, from the Birmingham News. And now, Bull probably started the conversation. I don't know whether Bull started the conversation or I started the conversation. But at any rate, it was not a hostile conversation. It was, and it was a quite calm conversation. And uh, some of the things that I, uh, that really, really stand out that I remember in the conversation um, with Bull, when we got to a little town called Cubman, Alabama. Now, it was a sundown town. How many know what a sundown town is? Let me see your hand. Okay, so Tell just, them what just a, a few. Is. A sundown town is a town that blacks can't be caught in after the sun go down. Uh, you just might get killed. Yes, you looking surprised? Yes, so, uh, yes, that was sundown town. So Bull made Bull made the comment. And those uh, signs were really there. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Matthew told me earlier what they said. Tell, uh, let let our audience know what the sign said in Coleman. In Coleman, the sign in 1938 said, "Inward." Read and run. And if you can't read, run anyway. <laughs> so go ahead, take up the story okay. with Bull. And so Bull said, well, I guess I better pull the curtains down. And uh, he said, you, you know, you're going, we're going through Coleman, and you're not supposed to be here in Coleman. The sun was down, and it was probably about, oh, about 2 o'clock, about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. And so I, you know, I'm, I'm quite sure, I don't re rightly remember the answer that I gave him. 
but yeah, I am quite sure that it, 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 was, it was probably the answer that would suit the uh, occasion. Somehow we got around to the 1948 convention, Democratic convention. Now, how many know what happened at the 1948 Democratic convention? Let me see your hand. <laughs> okay, let me tell you what happened, just two or three hands. Now, that's very important. What happened at the, because that's part of your history. All of you all, black and white. That was when the Southern Democrats walked out. Walked out of the Democratic Party. And they uh, started a new organization. How many of you have heard the Dixocrats? I know everybody here ain't going up now. <laughs> the Dixocrats, they started the Dixocrats. And the Dixocrats met in Birmingham, Alabama at the city of Turin. And I told Bull, that you know that was that was wrong that that was not right that uh, uh, they should have been ashamed they was wasting up our tax money and Bull had walked out himself yeah 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 Bull was there with them Bull had walked out and they uh, they nominated who who did they nominate to run for the president of the Dixocrat during that time let me see your hands now he was very he was a very important man he he just lived forever. Strong term. I haven't heard of strong term. Strong. <laughs> All right then. Now, yes. That's who they ran for president. Now, and so Bull and I, you know, talked about uh, talked about that. I invited Bull to have breakfast with us on Fisk campus or uh, one of the restaurants around. Gonna have there. a little sit in on a Fisk campus <laughs> with Bull. <laughs> yeah, because you know, Tennessee State, you know, state school. And we probably couldn't have breakfast there, but I figured that, you know, and he said yes, I figured that, uh, you know, Fitz wouldn't mind. But see, all the time, Bull didn't know what he's fixing to do to us. And then, see, all the time, see, we, we on two different roads. All the time, I'm, you know, I done lean back now, you know, I'm comfortable just, you know, just, just, just having a conversation with uh, Bull, match for match. And uh, I guess the rest of them, Lewis, and the rest of them knees and stop knocking now you know, in the back. And because um, I'm knowing that when we get to Nashville, we're going to get some money from somewhere, and we're just going back to Birmingham. But I'm thinking that I'm going to Nashville, and Bull knowing that he's going to drop us on the street in uh, Artmore, Alabama. And so that's what he did. He dropped us, and the, all of a sudden, the cars stopped, and the uh, Everybody, uh, the, uh, the other policemen got out and Bull got out, and they threw our luggage out on the ground. And Bull, uh, Bull pointed to a building, and he said, there's a train station over there, and you all can get a train back to Nashville, Tennessee. And what did you say to him? And I said to him, I said, now, you know I couldn't let him have the last word. <laughs> Just as he was about to get in the car, I said, we'll see you back in Nashville, uh, back in Birmingham, by high noon. Because, <laughs> you know, something going, you know, if anything is going to happen, anybody doing anything wrong, then, you know, we're going to meet by high noon. And so I told him we would meet, we would see him back in Birmingham by high noon. Of course, uh, when we walked over, over to that place, that was not a train station. That was a warehouse. Then, you know, he said, uh-uh, ain't no telling what's going to happen now. But we did uh, find a family that uh, took us in. The man was a little afraid. African-American uh, family uh, was yes, yes. frightened that if he took in these Freedom Riders, mm -hmm. uh, violence would be visited on him and his family. That's right. But he took you in. Yes. But let me back up just a, a little bit because, see, you all don't know now how to handle yourself in situations like that. We had to be, not somebody sit you down and say, okay, when this happened, this is what you do. When that happened, this is what you do. But then you observe and you hear the older people talking. Now, we knew how black people houses look and, where, and black people's on one side of the, the railroad track and white people on the other side of the railroad track. And as we walked down the railroad track, and then, then we saw, yep, those, those are where the blacks live. And then we picked the house. Now, of course, we didn't know we was right, but we picked the house, and then, then that was a, a black house. Man, uh, man uh, we knocked on the door. Man came to the door, and he was afraid to let us in. We told him that, uh, I don't know exactly you know, which one was speaking, told him that uh, we was Freedom Riders, and, and Bull Connor had put us out. And you could understand why he would be uh, afraid because of what was going to happen to him. 
And I turned around and I told the group, I said, let's talk loud and wake up his wife. <laughs> and she'll let us in because my mom had always told me to try to talk to the lady of the house if you need some help. And sure enough, we talked loud and then I heard her hit that floor and say, let them children in here. <laughs> and I heard the locks coming off the door. <laughs> and then, you know, then we were... Uh, they took you in and you had the networking um, going and within no time, Diane Nash has dispatched uh, uh, your mother's car. <laughs> and I car? didn't know that was uh, your, uh, Leo borrowed your mother's car. I knew That's it right. was one of the... Uh, and uh, so Leo, Leo Kwame Lillard, Lillard comes down and picks you up. Uh -huh. And you don't beat Bull back to Birmingham, but it's close. Well, we don't get back there by high noon. <laughs> but we get... <laughs> Had you known before you left that you were going to be expelled from Tennessee State A&I University... Would it have made any difference if they said, I will tell you, if you get arrested, you're going to get expelled. The governor doesn't uh, like anything that's going on. Both of you must have known that it was a risk that you would be expelled as you were. Matthew and Susan uh, are in private schools, and the state can't touch them, but both of you are vulnerable. Would it have made a difference? No, it wouldn't have made a difference for me. I was a senior and I had only nine hours to do before graduating. And I knew, you know, in my heart that uh, if, you know, if I didn't graduate from Tennessee State, I was going to graduate from, some, from somewhere unless I was dead. And, and that was a possibility. That was very, certainly a possibility mm -hmm. going on these rides. So you had a reason to fear death really more than expulsion. Mm, oh, well, yes, but then that's part of it. Sure you know, that's, that's part of it that you have to come to grips with early if you're going to do something like this. It's part of it that so many of us still wonder about and admire in the decisions you made. But, Rip, what about, what about you? Would it, if well, you had known you were going to get kicked out of school and would not be able to go back and that the following September, John Lewis, now a congressman, would stand in front of the governor's office door and have all of your names written, who all the 14 had been expelled. The governor went out the back door rather than meet with them. You never got back in. Would it have made a difference? It wouldn't have made a difference simply because, uh, first of all, I always uh, allude back to the sit-ins. Uh, being a Nashvilleian, there were a lot of out-of-state students that came to Tennessee State. Uh, that was uh, probably the number one school to attend in the South for uh, Negroes. And to me, it was Nashville's my home. Why should I let an outsider who's coming to school uh, go downtown, do the sit-ins, the stand-ins, swim-ins, or whatever ends that we were doing, <laughs> why should I sit back and, and reap the benefits? So I joined the movement for that reason. And as you've already heard, we became a very close-knit family. I was in the third wave to leave Nashville, and uh, I was in school up until it, was, until it was time for me to go. And I, I don't think that I could have survived mentally by not going, knowing mm -hmm. that Sue and Catherine were already there. And what Jim had said about Jim, uh, Jim Swerg. Oh, Jim Swerg, yes. What he had said uh, about what might happen. And we'd already seen what had happened with the core group. So there was no way that I was going to uh, not go. We have a question. Uh, yes, my first question is for John and for Susan. I was just wondering, uh, compared to your African-American counterparts, what was your treatment like when you were in the South, when you were in Alabama and Mississippi, and what feelings did you have towards the mobs as you entered these cities and you could see them, and uh, how, did, how did you feel when you saw these mobs? Susan? Scared to death. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I think <laughs> Catherine's much braver th than I no. am uh, in, in those in that regard. Uh, and I don't know if you know the story, 
Mr. Siegenthal are sort of wound up uh, with a concussion because he was trying to get me into a cab. I, do any of you here know the story at all? Okay. Uh, I had to apologize to him today because I haven't seen him since he was probably <laughs> face down actually on the pavement. And I had to apologize for not getting in that car with him. Um, so Thanks um, a lot, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to see him again. Um, but, I, I mean, I, I had never experienced anything like that. Uh, Jim Zwerg is really got the worst physical treatment. Was a white ministerial student. Right. And, and uh, I saw him get terribly beaten. In fact, I thought he, that he was dead because I saw him, you know, just go down and saw people beating on him. And, and uh, this was before Mr. Siegenthaler tried to get us in the, in the car. Um, I had never experienced, I'd never even seen anybody, you know, fist fighting. I mean, you see things on television, but it's not real life. And um, so we had had, we had, had the uh, stand-ins and the sit-ins in Nashville, but the, the stand-ins anyway, we got called a lot of very nasty names and things shouted at us and so forth, but there wasn't a lot of physical violence. I don't know why, but there wasn't. And so um, I really had, was not prepared for, for this kind of thing. And, um, and after it was over, it took me a long time. I realized how traumatized I was really, you know, um, for a, a long time. I couldn't be in crowds, you know, crowds would make me nervous, things like that. Because I had never seen anybody really want to, really, really hate me and really want to, to kill me if, you know, uh, people I didn't know, people I'd never seen before, simply because of who I was with. And that was a whole new experience for me. Did you want me to respond to that? Well, I, as you know, I, as most of you know, I was a son of the racist, segregated South. I grew up in it. It was part of the culture. Uh, if you were an African-American in this city, in Nashville, Tennessee, or in any city in the South, you were an African-American, there were signs that told you you could not go to most of the places you might need to go or you might want to go. Um, hospital, restaurant, hotel, city park, water fountain, bathroom. The sign said, you must not go. You may not go or you will suffer arrest. And I grew up in that culture, sat on buses, watched the counterparts of Rosa Parks get on those buses late in the afternoon, carrying bundles, who knows, bringing home the washing from some white woman's household, maybe my mother's household. They get on those buses and struggles and I know Rip has heard me say this before, I never saw them. And you say, how can that be? How could you have never seen them? And I guess I didn't understand myself until I read Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man in which he says, they never saw me. Mm -hmm. You know, they looked at me, over me, around me, under me. They never saw me as a human being. And where I, where I am now, looking back on it, I wonder what my parents were thinking, not to explain to me the injustice and the indignity of that. I've said, where's my head and heart? Never heard it in school, that it was wrong, that it was outrageous. Never heard it on Sunday from the pulpit once. And that's the way that I would answer your question by describing just how viciously, venomously racist this city was. Um, but they know it far better than I. Um, Matthew, you 
came up uh, in this city. Mm -hmm. uh, your father, a distinguished doctor, mm -hmm. entitled to every accolade a medical professional could earn, and still he had to suffer that sort of uh, racist exclusion. Mm -hmm. And you were his child. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you came along, and how did he feel about your going? My father fully supported my participation in the sit-ins and the Freedom Ride. Um, I was fortunate beyond belief in my choice of parents. <laughs> um, <laughs> both my parents were very supportive. My mother worked in a numerous capacities as far as the movement was concerned, so Whenever I decided to do something, I remember having one conversation with my father about what it was about, and he just wanted to see if I knew what I was doing. But uh, neither of my parents ever told me no, and I was just uh, impressed with the movement. Jim Lawson gave us a good background, made the working of um, nonviolence very believable because he used the example of uh, Gandhi with the Indians getting their freedom from the uh, British. So we knew that nonviolence was something that could work, and uh, it, it, it did work, but I was just impressed with it all along because as a black person in America, I think the answer to the question, why did you get involved in the sit-ins? Why did you get on the bus? I think the short answer to that question could always be because I was black, because I had experienced racism in America. That gives you enough ammunition, enough motivation, enough incentive to take whatever risk, because nobody wants to live under those conditions. Question. Hello, my name is Shantasia Shorter from Tennessee State University. And my question is for Dr. Burks Brooks. In that time, the Freedom Riders had an extraordinary level of fight in their spirits to go out and do what they did. And because of that, students like myself are able to reap the benefits. But I feel that sometimes we are so caught up in the business of being successful that we don't recognize the high levels of disparity around us in our community. And my question is, what would you say to the people who are so caught up in success that they don't want to get out and advocate for the equality of everyone? I would say that uh, they are going down a dangerous road and to tell them that uh, they need to uh, wake up and look around them. And whatever you see that need to be fixed, then that's what you start concentrating on and uh, find others who feel the same way. And if it's two of you, then you look for a third one and you go on and then you get started. You get to move and you do something. You don't just sit and say, well, it's just me, so I can't do anything. Question. My question is for all of you. Um, have you, you were, you were all assaulted in one way or another, be it verbal, physical, mentally. Have you ever been able to confront any of those people who had assaulted you somehow? And what happened during that experience? if you don't mind telling. Well, let me just say first, I never saw him again. I never <laughs> want to see him again. Um, and if I'd seen the fellow with a pipe, I'm, I'm afraid I would not have been as nonviolent uh, as the Freedom Riders would have been. But, but Rip and Susan and Catherine and Matthew, what about it? I've never seen one. I've never met a person that uh, had uh, violence or was violent towards me? Well, uh, no. Uh, I didn't have the opportunity to uh, get back with Bull, but I understand, <laughs> understand why he was sick there in the hospital and before he left here that he was, he was trying to apologize to all blacks that, that, uh, that he would come in contact with and trying to help them. But now, uh, I remember one demonstration uh, one white fellow said that he was going to put a cigarette out on my face. And uh, then I started concentrating on this uh, song that uh, I shall not uh, be moved. But now uh, it's, I was fortunate that he didn't do it. 
So I don't know what I was going to do at that point. Now, my girlfriend, Lucretia, was, we were demonstrating in the theater, and uh, she was standing behind me. Now, she said that she was going to put her hand between the cigarette and my face, but I, I never had uh, the uh, experience of being uh, hit. Matthew? No, I, uh, I have had the experience of being hit, but I haven't ever seen any of the people who assaulted us during that time. I, I think they just would make it their business not to... Uh, not to have any contact with us. If you visit the downtown library, um, there is a group of videos there, one of which <clears throat> interviews a number of people um, whose language reflects white attitudes at that time uh, in the worst possible way. Uh, it's uh, vulgar and, uh, and mean-spirited. It's hateful. My name is Doug Walker, and uh, I'm a senior also at American Baptist College. Um, I continue to be uh, tremendously impressed, even 50 years later, um, at the idea of young college students, particularly freshmen, writing their will. Um, and uh, in the case of one particular, William Barbie, actually being forced to actually follow through on that will. Um, what I wanted to ask you, Mr. Sigenthaler, um, you asked them how this event had changed their life. What I wanted to ask you was, how did these events and these students and your observation of them affect you? I was an accident of history. <laughs> if she'd gotten in the car that day, we'd have been out of there and I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have been injured. Uh, they would be here with somebody, uh, but I, wouldn't, I, would, I would not. I, I think back on that time and think of the city I came from. Um, I think about the role I played in that day and I come away with it still wondering where their courage came from. It took no courage for me to jump out of a car, grab a young woman oh, by the did. arm and put her, try to get her into that car. We'd have been gone. But think of the courage. Think of the courage it took of the, for them, for children, to literally take their lives in their own hands. You can't live through watching young people with that sort of commitment, and it was their commitment. You can't watch them and not come away 50 years later, still wondering, still admiring, still in, that, in awe of how they changed my town, changed my region, and helped change the nation. Let me just ask you all uh, maybe a final roundup question. How, how did the Freedom Rides change your lives, if at all? Well, not only did it change my life, it changed this nation. Uh, a lot of things came out of the Freedom Rides and uh, with people uh, getting out of jail and not just going back to their homes and saying, okay, we did it. Uh, I got out and came back and Pauline Knight, one of the young ladies that was expelled, we immediately started uh, walking through neighborhoods where there was a Kroger or, or H.G. Hills to uh, canvas the area and to get people to uh, boycott those stores. And we worked on that particular project. Uh, some people uh, did other things. And so... Uh, and that was after you came back from Parchman Prison. After we got out of Parchman. And Parchman Prison, where, where you and a number of other Freedom Riders were incarcerated, at that time was known as the hellhole of American prison. Yes. And there were many people who went in there uh, who lost their lives there. And I think so many of us who knew where you were worried that uh, your lives would be taken in Mississippi. You had survived the Freedom Rides, but you might not survive Parchman. Before we move on, just say a word about Parchman and, and how, life, how the life was there, because I'm not sure people really grasp the depth of the punishment 
that was visited on you as a result of your courage? Well, I remember uh, things that they would do. Uh, singing was very important, uh, and they didn't like it when we would sing, and we were constantly singing. I hope you'd go this way. You might just give us an example. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think the one I used on the Oprah show was a demonstration about the mattress. When we would sing, they would say, okay, if you keep singing, we're going to take something away from you or they're going to do something. And this one particular time, they took our mattresses away. And so I was sitting there and we would start singing, you can take our mattress, oh yes. You can take our mattress, oh yes. You can take our mattress, you can take our mattress, you can take our mattress, oh yes. So whatever they did, we would sing that melody and just add the word to like toothbrush or they, they would turn off the water or they'd turn up the heat uh, in the day and this was in the summer. They'd turn the air conditioner on at night uh, while we were on the steel box or they would uh, put some laxative of some kind in the food and turn the water off. We were in a six by eight cell, uh, two of us. Uh, my roommate was uh, Jan Triggs out of New York. And so they would uh, give us something in the food because they just didn't want us to sing. How can you be in an institution like that and be so spirited and sing? Uh, I know that uh, and was it, when was it, was we were arrested and were put in the paddy wagon, that's the first thing we would sing, we shall overcome. So we was always singing. Singing was a, a means of communication, for example, in the uh, county jail. And I believe to, to this day that, that's okay, uh, that uh, the jail had a, was in a square with a, a court in, uh, inside. And we would, uh, Bernard and two or three others, we would get up close to the window when we were in the county jail and we would sing songs. And then we'd stop, and then we would hear the girls who were somewhere else. We could hear them singing. We'd wait till late at night when the traffic had died down. And then we'd hear maybe the white girls singing, and then the white males. Or what this was, this was a communication that said, we're okay. We're letting you know that we're okay. And that's how we communicated in the county jail. But once we got to Parchment, it was just that long row that you'll see if you haven't already seen the documentary that uh, we would sing. Uh, the ladies, they had a different something else going on because we had two in each cell with two bunks. They were a little bit different. They had some crowded issues in the, in the late with the ladies. But singing was important. And that's what we would do to actually give us peace of mind and just worry them. Just, they, just, they just couldn't take the singing. Susan, how has your life been changed by well, I, I think um, I think that it it made me realize um, a connection that 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 race um, you know race did not have to be a divider that I, we, I felt a connection with with everyone in the movement that I never lost. Um, I think it was I was able to hopefully maybe Jonathan can can answer this better than I can my son. Um, pass the idea on to, to my children that if you see something that is wrong, that you, you need to, to, to try to do something about it, that individuals really can make a difference, that we think we can't, um, but that if enough of us, if, if enough of us do, you know, get together, that we can change things and that you should not ever say in life, well, it's wrong, but it's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. that you ought to try, as, as Catherine's pointed out many times, to do something about it. And I think one of the joys of my life is that Jonathan's, one of my 11 grandchildren, Olivia, who's six years old now, um, has many friends um, of many different you know, colors, and she, she doesn't think anything about that now. I mean, and, and I'm not saying that racial issues don't certainly exist, they do. Um, but I think there's a beauty in the fact that she will be able when she grows up if she, to marry a person of color if she wishes to. Um, 
and I think that all that is important. She needs to, you know, we ought to, to be able to, uh, to marry uh, whom we love, uh, be it color, be it gender, and I think that's a new, uh, a new civil rights issue that nobody much wants to talk about, but is very real right now. Um, and I think we, we need to always be aware that it's important for us as human beings to watch out for each other and it, it's, a, it's all our struggle. And I think that's what it taught me. Catherine? Well, it exposed me to a number of people that I'm quite sure that I probably wouldn't have met. For instance, uh, Walter Johnson, which was the president of the history department at the University of Chicago. And Walter had some, uh, some books that I used to just thumb through there in his library. And I began to ask him questions that he uh, couldn't answer. Then, then I would start searching on my own. So history is very important. Your ancient history. And it's very important that we know that, that we know at one time we had a fantastic civilization. The ancient Egyptians, the Nubians, and right straight on down. I may have brought a number of things away uh, from the Freedom Ride. Um, one is that it showed me that in spite of the level of hatred we saw with the behavior of some of the locals in Alabama and Mississippi, uh, that there is overall a great moral compass in this country and that uh, if you were to look at, shall we say, the soul of America, I think it is because of that soul, because of the Christian basis this country is founded on and those things that um, survive uh, to this day, it was because of the fundamental belief in Christian type principles that the nonviolent campaign was able to be successful. I'm not saying it was easy, but I am saying that uh, Nonviolence struck a chord with the majority of Americans. Mm -hmm. I would say that I also learned that a few people can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have a great amount of money, huge resources to make change. And that's something I think is as true today as it was 50 years ago. On a personal note, one of the things that the experience taught me is that one can overcome fear because I believe anybody who participated, freedom rights, sit in and said they weren't afraid, I think they're not being truthful. I think we were all afraid, but it was a question of overcoming that fear. And uh, I think that's, that's a lesson which has lasted to this day with me in terms of being able to deal with whatever fear I may face. It's a question of not letting fear rule your life. Uh, and I also think that the, uh, another thing that the experience of the Freedom Ride and the sit-ins taught me was that you can um, learn from other people because one of the things that made what we did successful was that we actually inspired each other to see somebody else willing to take the risk that you were willing to take I think it's something that gave each of us added courage and uh, the will to go ahead and take this chance, see whether or not this is going to work. Don't worry about the fact that somebody got hurt. Try anyway. And other people felt the same way. And I believe that's where the singing came in, too, because singing was a way to reaffirm among ourselves that, you know, yes, I'm on board with you, you know, and it, it was just a way of communicating some of the things that caused the uh, bond to develop between us simply because I believe that uh, there was a level of mutual respect with everybody because here was somebody else willing to do these things. I'd like to close, if you don't mind, with a deeply personal story. <clears throat> I have a grandson, um, and two of you have mentioned your grandchildren, and Jack Siegenthaler is, uh, is his name. And when I go up to visit, uh, it's used to be my J. 
job at night to read him a story. He now reads to me. But when Jack was five, I was visiting over Thanksgiving, went up uh, to read the story. And his father, John, came in and said, now, Dad, long day today, Thanksgiving tomorrow, another long day, one story, read Jack, only one story. Jack, do you understand? Grand is only going to read one story. Yes, Dad. Yes, son. One story. So I read, and at the end of it, he said, Grand, Dad said you could read me one story, but you could tell me another story. <laughs> I said, fine, Jack, but it'll have to be quick. And he said, well, we were watching television, and we saw a documentary on the Freedom Rides, and we saw a man, he was bald-headed, but he was an actor, and he was playing your part. And Mom and Dad, when I asked them about it, told me to ask you. And I said, well, it will be quick, but it's a story with a happy ending. One day in Montgomery, Alabama, there was a mean, angry, hostile white people who didn't want to let black people ride the bus. Um, and they beat the black people up, put them in the hospital. They beat me up and put me in the hospital. But we all came out of the hospital. And today, Jack, we can all ride the bus. And you know, you look at the child of a five, the face of a five-year-old child, and you don't know exactly what wheels are turning. That's true. I said to him, Your mom and dad told you to watch that. And he said, yes, Grant. I have a question. Are you black? And it took my breath away. <laughs> and it reminded me of something you said. That child is going to have a chance to grow up in a world that, for him at, now, at this point, is at least colorblind. Mm -hmm. I said to him, it really doesn't make any difference, does it? I returned to Nashville and thought about it, wrote him a letter, which five or six years later, he reminded me and read. And I said, Jack, I told you that color doesn't matter. You're five and I'm 75. Mm -hmm. I wish it didn't matter. I can only hope by the time you're 75 that it won't matter anymore. And you know, when I think of what Channel 8 is doing with this program, when I think of what Oprah has done with her program, when I think of that national book and, and video documentary on the Freedom Rides, um, really makes me think that we won't have to wait till Jack 75 before color won't matter. Thank you all very, very Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Buses are coming. Oh, yeah. Freedom Riders on NPT is made possible by the generous support of Baker Donaldson, offering legal clients knowledgeable guidance from experienced industry and client service teams in 16 offices across the Southeast and Washington, D.C.